Hey, Mr. Ben. Hey, I'm back in black. Perfect. <laughs> um, so we're talking about groundwater again and how groundwater flows beneath the surface. So mm -hmm. we got a ton of learning targets for you. We're not going to pause or we're not going to say them all. No. Just pause it, read through them. Make sure you guys follow through the learning targets based on what we're saying on the slides. They all kind of tie together and then the tests are based on those targets. So if they understand all of those bullet points, then they should be okay on the quiz. They're gold and that's what we're looking for you guys to accomplish today. All right. Well, let's see what we can talk about. Oh, I love maps. All right, I'm a big map guy too. So we've got two maps kind of laid on top of each other. One of them is called the topographic map, mm -hmm. where it shows the change in elevation of a landscape, so like a hill in this case. It's like the black lines? The black lines, okay. yeah. And what they used to do actually was they would drill a bunch of holes into a landscape, mm -hmm. and they would measure how far down the water was. Mm -hmm. And then they would map that on that map. So mm -hmm. basically if like you were building a house, you could look on the map and see, oh, I need to drill a well. I'm going to need to go down 200 feet until I hit water. And they actually started learning that the groundwater wasn't like flat okay. across. It hadn't like settled all the way. It actually followed the contours of the slopes or like of the, the hills. So that blue line, those blue lines that are on that map, which are like the black lines, are similar. That's actually the slope of the water under the ground. Yeah, the water's actually sloped under the ground, and the water actually flows underneath our feet. And sometimes it's really slow, sometimes it's mm -hmm. actually pretty a little quicker than that. So it looks like the slope is basically the same, just not exactly one kind of right on top of the other, but a similar slope. Yep, absolutely. Wow, so you can tell where the water is under the ground. It's not in a river like we learned in the last slide. Yep. And it flows. Yeah. High to low. And they used to figure out by drilling big holes, which is really cool. That must be why, like, when they drilled at the farm that I used to work on, they kept real close track of, like, where they found the water and what the water was like, and they have drilling logs that they have to keep. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. What's next? Okay, so next we're talking about um, just basically where the water is and what it looks like. Okay? okay, so we're hammering home this point that water isn't just in rivers or in big reservoirs underneath us or big okay. lakes underneath us. It's actually just between a bunch of the pore spaces. Okay. So it's kind of like the ground's a sponge and it soaks up. So if you look at these pictures on the side here, we've actually got little grains. And all these grains have little spaces between them. Okay. Just like if we filled this room with beach balls, mm -hmm. there'd be spaces between those beach balls. All right. And those would all be the pore spaces that we call. And the water goes through those? Yep. The water goes through them, and basically that's where all the groundwater is stored. Wait. Is that like when I went to the beach and I dug a hole near the beach, and I like put my feet in the hole, and the water kept coming in no matter how much I dug out? Exactly. The water is actually flowing between those little grains of sand? Yep. Ah, now I get it. So the empty spaces between the grains are called pore spaces. Yep. And that's where most of the water is found. Mm -hmm. So when you drill a hole in the ground for the well, you're actually pulling the water out of those holes. Yep. And then you said it's kind of slow, and that would make sense because it probably takes a while for the water to go through those tiny little holes. Yeah, and depending on the size of the holes, if they're really big and they're all connected to each other, mm -hmm. they can flow pretty quick, so like mm -hmm. a few meters a day. Mm -hmm. But if they're really small holes and they're not as connected, it can be really slow. Mm -hmm. You know, or sorry. Did I say that again? Sorry. Uh, it can be really slow, a few centimeters a day. Mm -hmm. um, and so it says that water uh, tends to collect above layers that are impermeable. Mm -hmm. So, like, basically layers with small pore spaces or pore spaces that aren't connected. So the water keeps going down until it hits that impermeable layer and builds up. Yep. And that's where you'd get that saturated zone to your water table to your unsaturated zone. And water probably flows through in a lot of places about this much in a whole day. Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. So it's pretty slow. Cool. And would this have to do with how fractured the bedrock would be? Yeah, like if you've got a crack in the rock, like water will flow through some of those cracks too. So fractures and joints are going to change the um, how fast the water goes through. Absolutely. All right. Porosity. Lots of P words in this one. Absolutely. Okay, cool. so this porosity, it's simply a measure of that pore space. Okay. Okay, so if you were to take, say, a sponge, mm -hmm. there's more than just the sponge material. There's actually spaces between the sponge. Right. And we're measuring that volume of open space. Okay, so porosity is like the amount of pore space or empty spaces in the actual sediment or whatever you're looking at. Yep, absolutely. So the more hole, empty holes you have in it, the mm -hmm. higher the porosity. Yeah, and like you guys saw before, like in the unsaturated zone, you can fill the pore spaces with air and water. Okay. Or if you're in the saturated zone, you can fill it completely with water. Ah, so if it's saturated, it's saturated with water. Yep. If it's unsaturated, it could have a little bit of water in it, but mostly air. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well, looking at that list of porosity, it, um, that kind of surprises me. I think a clay and all those small, like, little tiny particles, I wouldn't expect the porosity to be high, but could the porosity be... The pore spaces can be really small though, right? Yeah, so with clay, the pore spaces are really small and they're actually just not really connected. They're uh -huh. all kind of all over the place and it's not able to flow between them. We'll get to that in a little bit. So porosity, the that might be based on like in gravel, you'd have like big chunks mm -hmm. and big holes, yep. but it's still a percent of how much the, the empty holes are compared to the big thing. Yep. Uh, so, you, so it's not, you kind of have to think of the percent that way. Yep, absolutely. All right, but that doesn't have to do exactly with how fast the water goes through. Yeah, it has nothing to do with how it flows yet. That's okay, another we're talking keyword. just about the amount of open space that we have. So this would be like how much the rock or the sediment could hold water. Yeah. Okay. And one thing I think that's interesting, they might not know what it is, is uh, glacial till. Mm -hmm. Why it's only 10 to 20%. Well, mm -hmm. glacial till, glaciers carry all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And when it melts, it drops everything. And it mixes really well. So it's actually what we call from uh, sedimentary rocks, it's poorly sorted. Oh, kind of like gray wacky. You got the big and the smalls together. Yep. So some of those small particles fill in the pore spaces. Yeah. So how uh, that's why it is a lot less permeable or a lot less porosity. Yeah. So like if you took a room filled with um, beach balls mm -hmm. and then dumped a bunch of marbles in it. Oh, and some of those marbles would get into the spaces between the yep. beach balls, so the porosity would go down. Yep. All right. Hey, that's the other p word. This is. This one has to do with how quick the water goes through. Yep. So permeability, it's simply the ability to transmit water. So okay. something that's highly permeable would be something that allows water to flow through it. Mm -hmm. something, like the one on the left. Yep, the one on the left. So you can see water going in up top. It goes in or it goes right through it. Right. Okay. Something that would be impermeable would be something that doesn't allow water to pass through easily. So you still could have pores. You could mm -hmm. have a high porosity, but if the water can't get through the pores, if they're not connected, like you said with clay, it might be a low permeability. Yep. Because you have to be able to get through it. So that would be the one on the right where only a little bit of water gets through. Yeah, we're dumping a lot of water. And that actually looks like it might be a bunch of clay. And mm -hmm. the clay actually soaks up that water and doesn't let it pass through it very well. So it's impermeable. Okay. So permeability, the ability of water to go through. Yeah, and we usually talk about this permeability when we're talking about those uh, aquifers, those uh, large quantities of uh, materials that hold those quantities of water. And it's due probably in part to the porosity, but also your fractures and your joints? Yep. Okay. Ooh, here's that, ta that table of porosity again. Um, but... Uh, well, well, what we're going to jump into, we're going to talk about, we see a couple different uh, grain sizes there, and we're going to talk about the different materials having high permeability. So maybe they should make a column on the right side of that with permeability where that white space is. Yeah, and actually we're going to check out a quick demo to show an example of a different permeabilities for different objects. Okay, that sounds exciting. Yeah. So what we've got here is we've got three bu or four buckets, one okay. filled with gravel, one filled with sand, one filled with silt, one filled with clay. We're going to okay. fill them up with water, time how much time it takes for the water to pour through it. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let you guys take a second to think to yourself, which one do you think the water is going to flow through the fastest? All right. I hope you got your answers written down. We're going to see which one it flows through the fastest. So we're pouring water into it. So you all get the same amount of water. Yep. Ooh, the water leaked out right away out of the gravel. And the gravel, that makes sense, because there's big pore spaces. The water travels through it really quick. And they connect really easy yep. because of big spaces, like the beach balls. Yep. And sand took about two hours to pour through the sand, so there's less pore spaces, and they're still connected. It just takes longer to th flow through. Oh, so it's dribbling out. It's slowly kind of going through. Yep. Now, when we get smaller particle sizes, like with silt, mm -hmm. we actually don't have those pore spaces that are well connected, so it's okay. not very permeable. So they got to work their way through it. It'll take like 200 days. Yeah, and then clay, uh, don't be holding your breath here. It's going to take 200 years for that bucket of water to drain through. It's oh, ridiculous. man, just pretty much is not going through. Yeah, it's going to be stuck there. So hopefully you guys had some good, uh, some good estimations there, some good hypotheses that you guys made. So if oh back on oh. that slide, if they're going to add on the right there for their um, their permeability, the one that would probably be the highest, they would throw that one for the gravel, right? Yep. So gravel would be the most permeable, and then clean sand would be um, a little less. Yep. And then silt 
and then clay would be very impermeable. And what do you think of glacial till? It's mixed like a mixture of all of them. Well, like you said, it's, it fills in some of the spots in between. Maybe it's not as little as the clay, but probably somewhere around that silt, I would think. Yeah, it's not going to let water flow through as much because it's a mixture of all those different sizes. So maybe it's like between the silt and clay, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Turn the full screen. There we go. All right, discharge and recharge. So like, like a battery recharge when you put electricity in it. Yep. So the groundwater doesn't get electricity... It would recharge with water. Okay. Okay. So when it, the precipitation comes by, that would be recharge? Uh-huh. Okay. And so recharge, water comes from the sky, basically goes into the ground. In this picture, there's two different sections. You've got recharge on the far left, and that looks like it's recharging, um, you know, this area. That's that confined aquifer mm -hmm. that, um, that I, they were talking about in the last video. So that one's specifically for... A confined aquifer but this area here this would be from here over that would be just a general recharge for the regular water table mm -hmm. and one of the things to think about too um, if you had an area that was high in clay mm -hmm. do you think that clay would have a fast recharge rate I don't think the water could get through very quick I think it'd have a slow recharge yeah because it's not very permeable so it'd take water a long time to recharge in the area okay okay same thing with the discharge it'd be tough to pull water out of that clay mm -hmm. but if you had say a gravel it'd be a really fast recharge okay same thing with the discharge it would let water flow through it really easily so you'd be able to fill it back up and empty it really quick okay so like good farmer fields not a lot of clay because they want water to get you know, stay down there where it needs to be and not just kind of run off. Absolutely, yeah. So, oh, discharge. We didn't talk about discharge. Oh, uh, discharge, it was simply the amount of water that's basically leaving or flowing out of the uh, aquifer. Okay, so maybe going to that, um, maybe into the stream, leaving that way? Yeah, leaving out of the stream, just flowing out of it somewhere. Maybe it's going through a spring, it could be going to a river, a lake, or the ocean, something along those lines. Lower elevation. Or even being pumped out by humans. I mean, we oh, that's pump true. out and we get rid of a lot of water. You know, we cause a lot of discharge. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so this is what we were talking about with those maps before, that hydraulic okay. gradient. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's basically the slope of the water table. Right. Gradient means slope, right? Yeah, gradient plays the same thing as slope. Okay, in math, that's rise over run, right? Mm -hmm. But here it doesn't rise, water falls. So yeah. it'd be fall over run? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, so basically what we're looking at is that water is going to flow from a point of high elevation to a point of lower elevation. Okay. And that's how we get that groundwater move. So that's how we get recharging of our aqua aquifers and discharging of those aquifers. That makes sense. So yep. if you've got a spot way up here and a spot way down here, the difference between those two places where you encounter the, encounter the water, that's going to be um, the fall. Mm -hmm. like, and the run would be like the physical distance on the earth between them? Yep. Now if you had a big fall like this, that's like a lot of water. That would push a lot, right? Oh yeah. So the bigger the fall, kind of the more push there is through? Big time, yeah. But then, if you have the points way far apart, the yeah. run, then that big push would have to push it over a big distance. Yeah, so it's not going to flow as fast, yeah. So this has to do with what your fall is mm -hmm. divided by your run. Okay, good. Makes okay, sense. so now this is going to come up to a really cool law, Darcy's Law. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we are talking about those maps, where if you had a hill, mm -hmm. the water underneath the hill is going to kind of follow the path of the hill. Right. Okay, um, and you can see in the picture here, We've even got where the groundwater is kind of on an angle. Right. And what do you think is going to flow faster? Water that's on a really steep angle or water that's on a really gradual angle? I think steep angle would be like a lot of heavy weight of that water. Water is heavy. Yeah. That's going to push and make it go faster. Yeah, and that helps us explain Darcy's Law. So okay. it says groundwater flow velocity is proportional to the slope of the water table. Mm -hmm. So the steeper the slope, larger pressure difference between the two points. That makes sense. And then there's that constant that's in there, that coefficient, that hydraulic um, conductivity. Uh -huh. Didn't they, um, didn't Darcy and they do a lot of work trying to figure out not only um, how permeable the material was, but also like how dense or thick the liquid would be that would go through? Absolutely, because it's not always just pure water that we're flowing through. Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. 
So that um, hyd hydraulic conductivity, that constant, has to do with the permeability. It takes into account for that of the material and the, the density of the material going through. Yeah, they call it viscosity, like yeah. the resistance to flow. Yeah, which yeah. is more viscous, the more resistant to flow. Yeah, like syrup is highly viscous. Water would be low viscosity. That makes sense. So you got to put that all together, and you come up with that fancy-schmancy Darcy's Law. Absolutely. Okay, so we're looking at two different rivers here. Okay. Okay. Um, there's something main, big difference between the two. In the top one, I see like water, it looks like it's pointing and flowing into the river. Mm -hmm. But in the bottom one, it looks like it's kind of flowing out. What do you think's going on in that one? Okay, I remember Mr. Z talking about how sometimes the aquifer is at the same level of the river. That looks like the top one. Uh huh. So he was saying how water leaves the groundwater and goes into the river. Okay. So that must be. Um, a gaining stream where the stream gains, gains water from the uh, groundwater. And with Darcy's Law, we've got that change in slope, and it's basically pushing water, it's pressurizing water, like, into the stream. So the water that's uphill uh -huh. is actually pushing, forcing water into the stream. Yeah. Okay. And the bottom one, like with Darcy's Law, you can see that the water table is actually below the stream. Mm -hmm. So according to that, the stream is going to be basically pushing into the groundwater. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a really long river that goes across Africa? Ooh, is it the Nile? I think you're right. Okay. So that river goes through the desert. Uh -huh. The groundwater's got to be way down low. Yeah. So there must be a ton of water at the head end of it in order for the water to get all the way to the ocean. Because uh -huh. the whole way, it's got to leak water right into the ground to get to the groundwater. Yeah, and that'd be like a losing stream where it's kind of pushing down over that gradient. So by the time you got to the ocean, you've lost a ton of water from that river into the ground yeah, to feed the groundwater. Yeah, it's infiltrated. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so, this can actually happen over the same river over the course of a year, too. So like, depending if it's the rainy or the dry season? Yeah. So like for us, if it was like spring or fall, we get a lot of rain, mm -hmm. we'd have a higher water table, and that okay. gradient would be towards the river. All right. But like summer, winter, we might not have as much water. The gradient's going to be the opposite way. Water's going to kind of sink in or infiltrate the soil into the groundwater. So like last year when we didn't have a rain for a long time, yeah. there's still water in the stream, but slowly the stream's getting lower because the water is maybe leaking into the ground. Absolutely. Recharging yeah. the groundwater. Totally. All right. All right, that's all we got for today. So hopefully you guys are ready for your mastery check. Go back to your learning targets, retake any, uh, review any of the things you need to, and we got a quiz at your class website. So if they are confused about some of the bullet points, they could go back and watch the section of the video again? Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Cool, good luck, guys. Have fun.